Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this vaccine and COVID-19 information session with Dr. Kara Chris. Uh, a reminder that this session is on the record. We've enabled everyone to uh, record. If you have any problem with that, uh, please ping us in the chat. And with that, I will, oh, and also after the presentation, please raise your hand in Zoom if you'd like to ask a question. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Christ. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Dr. Kara Christ, Director of the Arizona Department of Health Services, and I hope everyone has had a great week. Um, I'm going to provide a brief presentation uh, like I normally do, and I will leave time at end uh, for questions. So here are the current data uh, in Arizona. So after reaching a peak of about 65,000 cases during the week of January 3rd, our cases have decreased in Arizona for the past seven consecutive weeks. So fewer than 20,000 cases were reported the week of January 31st, and they continue to drop. From a statewide perspective, we are also seeing a decrease in hospital bed use in COVID patients and as well uh, in our COVID-like illness metrics. Not a lot of change to our epi curve, except it continues to go down. Um, this is included in our weekly PDF and shows the cases over time with the mitigation strategies overlaid. Those that are in red are mitigation strategies that are still in place um, from this summer. Our percent positivity continues to drop as well. Um, again, this is the total tests. The number of unique patients is the dark green bars, the number of uh, tests that are performed in patients that have already gotten the test are the light gray bars. And you can see that our percent positivity um, has decreased for the last seven weeks. So moving into uh, COVID-19 vaccine distribution, I'll provide some updates on uh, COVID-19 vaccine and the implementation of our program here in Arizona. Um, we are very excited uh, to, to find out if the Janssen vaccine is going to be approved. It is a single dose refrigerated vaccine with approximately 85% effectiveness against severe disease, 100% protective against hospitalization and death from COVID-19. So this is very good data. It is a, a pending uh, emergency use authorization approval by the FDA. We anticipate approval either later today or early tomorrow. And if it's approved, we anticipate receiving vaccine in early March, which it doesn't seem like it, but um, that could be as early as next week or the week after. Um, we anticipate receiving between 50 and 60,000 doses in that initial allocation. And it will be allocated uh, to counties similarly to how we allocate the Moderna based on population. One of the things that um, we have been uh, given advanced warning of is because um, this will be a new vaccine um, that's coming into the market, the production may have some variability. So while we may be receiving 50 to 60,000 doses the first week, um, we should anticipate that weeks two and three will likely be less doses. This week, we held a meeting of the Vaccine and Antiviral Prioritization Advisory Committee. This was to discuss the approval and use of the Janssen vaccine in Arizona. Um, that was recommended to approve once the EUA is approved and the ASIP recommendations are formalized. We also talked about expansion of phase 1B at this, uh, at this meeting. Um, several counties have already moved fully into phase 1B and um, some have even moved into phase 1C. So we continue to monitor. There was no recommendation made on um, expanding the entire state to a phase 1B uh, at this time. 14 of our 15 counties are vaccinating people 65 and older. Um, and that is uh, the same as well as any state vaccination sites and the retail pharmacy uh, partnership program. So pharmacies that are participating in that. And as of today, over 1.6 million doses uh, have been administered statewide with over 1 million Arizonans receiving their first dose. This week, we launched our eligibility checker. This will continue to have 
improvements and upgrades added. It currently will tell you based on age and uh, your profession if you are eligible. Um, next week, we will be moving this into a Spanish format as well as adding it by county. Um, so continue to, uh, to keep an eye out for that. Um, if you look, that you will find the top bar on our homepage or on our uh, Find Vaccine webpage. When you click on it and input the information, it will let you know um, if you are eligible or not based on the information that you put. And it becomes a pop-up window. That's that little uh, window down at the bottom right. By the week of February 28th, we expect to receive over 1.9 million doses of vaccine. Over the last couple of weeks, we've gotten some um, increases in Pfizer as well as Moderna. Um, and you can see that our total allocation has increased in, in, um, in the cases of February 21st and February 28th. The Pfizer doses are not as significant as we had hoped because um, providers are routinely able to get uh, the, the, that sixth dose out of vials. So instead of reporting the number of doses um, as five doses per vial, they are now are reporting the number of doses that would be six doses in a vial. So if a tray has, um, it used to have 975 doses, now there's a, they're accounting for 1,173 doses per tray. However, it is still an increase. If you look at the weeks before, we were getting about 87 to 88 trays. When you move to February 21st, that was actually 103 trays. So we are starting to see increases in our vaccine allocation across the state. We did add a couple of updates to our vaccines, uh, vaccine administration data webpage. So when you go to our data um, dashboard and click on vaccine administration, you'll find some new data in that um, upper uh, row you'll see that we have included the percent of COVID-19 vaccine doses utilized, as well as the percent of people who have been vaccinated. And we'll continue to add to this website. Um, today, we uh, have updated and uh, should be online, uh, have added our zip code vaccination data. Right now, it's just showing the number of uh, doses per zip code that have been administered. We are looking for early next week, Tuesday or Wednesday, to add um, data that will allow people to visualize the percent of population vaccinated per zip code, as well as the percent of population 65 and older vaccinated for each zip code. And this is just a closer look with the um, uh, the current data that's in there. So this would show the number, the total number of vaccines administered um, by patient residents. So last week, uh, we've, we continue to um, look to add vaccine administration sites here in Arizona. Um, last week, we transitioned the University of Arizona Tucson pod to a state pod with the ability to scale up and provide 24 seven capacity um, as we get more vaccine. We also have over 500 provider sites that have received vaccine supplies around the state. That includes county health departments, hospitals, FQHCs, pharmacies, and other providers. Um, 1,700 long-term care facilities continue to receive vaccinations uh, through the CDC uh, Pharmacy Partnership Program. That has administered almost 89,000 doses of vaccine. 100% of skilled nursing facilities have been visited at least once and approximately 65% of our assisted living facilities have been visited at least once. We continue to add pharmacies to our uh, CDC retail pharmacy uh, partnership program. Um, last week, uh, we had had Walgreens, Rise, Safeway and Albertsons, CVS is now participating in the program and we've got additional partners who are wanting to be onboarded for that program. So we will continue to add additional retailers at this time. Um, we're very excited to announce that next week um, we will be transitioning the Chandler Gilbert Community College, which is currently a successful pod run by Dignity Health in Maricopa County. 
Um, we will be transitioning that to a state operated site starting Wednesday, March 3rd. Appointments for that will open at 9 a.m. on Monday, March 1st. Because of that limited vaccine supply, again, we're gonna start with a limited number of appointments, approximately 2,000 per day. Um, and it will have a similar capacity to State Farm Stadium and the potential to go 24 seven if and when we get uh, sufficient vaccine supplies in Arizona. One of the really exciting things that I don't know that we've talked about a whole lot, but we have uh, started targeted communications to high risk zip codes so that we can ensure an equitable distribution of vaccine. So we started a high intensity targeted messaging campaign to the 85009 zip code. This includes various components, including teletown halls in both Spanish and English, um, an active social media campaign and yard signs and community messaging that is placed um, with posters and things right in the community. And you can see that um, these, these assets are both in English and Spanish. This week, we had almost 600 people participate in the English uh, Teletown Hall and over 600 people participate in last night's Spanish Town Hall. However, we um, sent out pre-messaging prior to um, those calls and in English, we reached um, over 4,300 individuals and either left a live answer or a answering machine message and in um, for the Spanish one, we left over 6,000 messages. So really trying to connect with that community. Um, I think one of the cool things is, is the yard signs encouraging everybody to take those mitigation steps and to make sure that they get vaccinated when it's their turn. Um, we've dropped off over 2,500 yard signs um, in the 85009 um, zip code. So very exciting. We continue to look um, for additional uh, uh, high risk areas to continue these high intensity targeted efforts in. We're also going to be, um, you might have seen some of this, so I apologize if you already have, but we will be using our Roll Up Your Sleeve campaign. We're talking to our partners about uh, using that with their branding as well so we can get the message out there. Um, but you'll see that we've got significant social media um, using people from our community that people can relate with. We know that the data showed that um, individuals said that the people that they would listen to about getting vaccinated were healthcare providers or other individuals that they trusted who had already received the vaccine. So here you can see Regina Villa who uh, participated in our healthcare worker vaccination event here at the department. She was a Valley Wise uh, nurse that works in the ICU unit directly treating COVID patients. And she said that she was doing this to help slow the spread, that we all need to do something because they are all tired. And so that's a really great message. We can also, um, we also tried to take uh, some of the footage and the video about why people were choosing to get vaccinated. Um, Corey, can you press play on that? Oh, and we don't have sound. Hold on just a minute. We're going to get sound so you guys can hear it. It's, it's a, visually it's a nice video, but it's even better when we have sound. But really trying to target um, individuals that people could relate with in the community, as well as tell their story on why they were getting vaccinated. See if that works. And some of you might have even met Will when he was here getting vaccinated. All right. Do we have it, Corey? Oh, we do. No, that's okay. We don't have the video. Vaccination will help ensure that I can be by my wife's side when my son is born in March. And then again, trying to identify those frontline essential workers who are willing to step up and take the vaccine. Um, and then this is one more video, Corey. We you know we want to get back into the way things were. Is like that won't happen unless we all do our part and getting this vaccination, getting this uh, COVID vaccine. We can really knock this uh, virus out of basically the face of the earth by each doing our part. So that's why I did it personally. 
So what we're trying to do is connect the community with the importance of getting this vaccine. You'll see a number of these vignettes that are on our social media and being used uh, through, uh, through our campaign. We, we haven't stepped up the campaign um, where we, you will see more and more of this as the vaccine becomes more prevalent and as we move into additional phases, but wanted to give you guys an idea of some of the messaging that is out there um, encouraging people that when it's their turn, they should roll up their sleeve. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Christ. Our first question is from Nicole Grigg. Let me ask her to unmute. Hi, Nicole. Hello. Thank oh, you, you are. for doing this this Friday. I have three questions, but they're all just like related. Okay. Um, okay, so you said that the committee met for the vaccines. Um, I believe you guys met on Monday. Uh, you said at this time there was no recommendation for um, to move to 1B for the state. So when should we expect that? That's the first part of the question. So we're gonna to continue to meet with VAPAC. I know some of the things that we wanted to look at was um, some of the data on uh, you know, how much of the 1A and 1B population do we believe is estimated to have gotten that vaccine. Um, some of the members were gonna go back and get data specific to their counties. Um, and so probably looking at when specific, you know, when counties hit 50 or 60% of those populations that we estimate to be vaccinated, um, would be when we would look at moving into uh, future phases. Okay, so um, maybe in March or? I, I would anticipate in March. Um, I just don't know if it's like this week or mid-March just yet. Okay, and then my second question um, was going to be, I, I have a lot of people that ask about when one c will open and, um, and, and why some you know, critical industries, uh, going off the checker list, you know, it shows like restaurant workers and then other industry workers before those with high risk medical conditions. So um, those that are in those essential worker categories are in 1B. Are, are, in, are adults with uh, chronic medical conditions uh, at any age, so below the current age eligibility, aren't until phase 1C. And so that's, that was the prioritization okay. that was recommended by ASIP and VAPAC. Okay, so we don't know when 1C, when we'd be looking at that. Yeah, again, it's gonna depend on the amount of vaccine that we get and how quickly we can get through the, um, through the, the prioritization groups. Okay, and then my last question is just about that, um, uh, the, the checker on yeah. the eligibility on the website, which is really helpful. But when you do the drop down list, it lists, you know, all these different industries and, you know, we see uh, restaurant workers, you know, we see, I, I did not see construction workers. So is this a finalized list of what we should expect for 1B? I didn't see agriculture workers. So I'm just curious, um, you know, I think some people might be worried that there isn't there. So would they not be in 1B? So it is not finalized just yet. We, we are continuing to add professions and that will be based on um, the executive order as well as moving it into Spanish and then adding the, the county um, prioritization as well. So all of that will be built out and we're looking to get that added next week. But I think with the number of job professions that will continuously be added as we get inquiries and, um, and then can go back and fill in the sheet that feeds that formula. Okay, and do you know when the, the checklist of what industries will be in 1B will be, when, when people will know if they're in 1B? Yeah, so we are looking, that was something else that we were we were working with VAPAC on. Um, we looked at a number of other states that prioritized as well as the essential workers. So we are looking at coming out with a list. What we would caution everybody is if you don't see your profession, but you're in one of those larger categories, it's still there even if your job is, is not specifically listed. But if you have questions, what we would recommend is reaching out to your county health departments because the county health departments are gonna have the ability to sub-prioritize based on priorities within their counties. And so it's always good to check with them. Okay, thank you so much for all those, just answering all those. Yeah, Appreciate it. thank you. 
Next is Howard Fisher. Hi, Howie. Oops, hold on, Howie. Oh. Sorry. It, it must be Friday. Hi there. Hi. So, um, obvious questions to start off with Nicole asked. Yeah. Um, so, how do you determine, given what you say is in the eligibility list, where you fit in? I mean, uh, I am a communications worker, I am a reporter, uh, I am who knows what else. I mean, it. it it seems like you know, people are going to have to second guess where they fit in. Uh, it's sort of like you know one of those uh, categories you're asked to fill out about what profession you're in for the federal government. So how do people really determine where they fit? So we will be trying to give some guidance as, as we list potential uh, categories of professions. We will be trying to give some guidance and some examples. Um, what we would recommend is going, you know, trying to get as close as you can, but knowing that there are you know, endless job titles and names. So it's not gonna be possible for us to include all of them. Um, and then really work with the county health departments to determine if you meet that uh, frontline essential worker. So how you would be, um, and, and keep in mind, the, the categories aren't mutually exclusive. So even as we're looking at our population estimates, you know, I could, you can have a 65 year old healthcare worker with underlying medical conditions and they're going to be 1a because of their their profession so you would be media communications which is considered a uh, essential service and and would be prioritized as well wait 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 you just said something when did yeah. media become an essential i mean I, I'm, I'm not paying to be a smart ass on this but uh, you know when i looked at essential services whether it's agriculture or restaurant <laughs> workers uh, had I known that, I would have signed up long before before I did. I mean, when did you? Uh, oh, this well. This sounds real loosey goosey. No, so media is included in the essential services, especially even if you look at the uh, the um, executive order. But you would be included in one B. So if you've already gotten vaccinated, you're not eligible as a media just yet because we haven't moved into that full one B category. But if you, uh, if you were prioritized based on any of the other criteria, then, then you were fine. You shouldn't have signed up yet for the 1B essential worker because Maricopa County is not there yet. Well, I'm old, so I already got my first shot. But one other quick question. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned you know, the U of A and eventually going to 24 or 7, but you don't have the vaccine yet. Any idea when that's going to happen, that you'll have enough vaccine to say, yeah, we're going to start slotting people at three in the morning or whatever? Yeah, so um, what we're looking at is getting significant increases of vaccine through March and into April. So we would hope potentially end of March, beginning of April. Um, and those are some of the things that we're trying to figure out right now because, uh, you know, the, uh, all of us from Arizona know it's going to start getting hot relatively soon. And so what are the strategies? Are they later hours and earlier hours? Um, are they trying to find indoor locations for these mass vaccination sites? And, and then when can we go to 24 seven? So we've got a lot, of, uh, a lot of decisions to make about the ongoing pods um, as we start to move into the summer. So we're hoping it won't be too late to where it's too hot and we've already found in a suitable indoor location for it, but that is something that we're looking at. So is there an indoor, that brings up another question? Mm -hmm. Is there a point, you know, where you do have an indoor location at the U of A? So we would work with them. They do have, they have this really cool system where not only are they do doing drive-through, but they're also doing a walk-in clinic as well. And so we would work on that to find a potential indoor location for potential drive-throughs or some type of strategy that would allow the employees to be cooled. But they also have an indoor walk-up walk, in, walk up, um, vaccination site, which is really cool. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Howie. Peter Seymour. Hi, Peter. Well, Dr. Biss, good afternoon. All right, my first question here, again, along with the um, priority groups and who's next, uh, when the state does move to full 1D, will the occupations listed on the new drop-down menu on their site be the only ones eligible to receive uh, shots? No, so they won't be the only ones eligible. That was just a list of, um, you know, things that we knew definitely were eligible right now. We'll be expanding that based on the executive order and, and discussions with VAPAC as well as 
um, as we get inquiries and realize that they should be on there. And then uh, another topic now. Are there any judicial courts or grocery stores that are coordinating vaccinations for their workers, whether they're on site, you know, bringing in vaccines, setting up appointments, and how do they fit into the priority group? So they would also be in the 1B priority group. And so that is definitely something that if, if employers uh, have the capacity to do that and they work with their county health departments, that's a strategy where it, you know those frontline essential workers can get vaccinated. And that's all for me today, thank you. Thanks, Peter. Okay, uh, Lorraine. Yes. Hello. Oh, sorry, Lorraine, hang on. Oh, hold on. Oh, you got no it. Okay, oh, there you are. Set. <laughs> yeah, so on uh, Wednesday, uh, I saw that the local union and commercial workers union had sent a letter to you, um, you know, asking you to prioritize uh, essential food workers for vaccination. Um, have you seen that letter and can you tell me what your response is to that letter and the concerns that were raised? I'd have to go back. I, we, we've gotten actually a lot of letters asking us to prioritize different industries as part of the 1B. Um, if they do fall into one of those categories, the team does send them a, a response that says that they are eligible in the 1B. The only caution that we usually give out is that if somebody is prioritized in 1B, the counties can sub-prioritize based on limited numbers of vaccine doses, as well as the priorities within their counties. Sure, so yeah, I guess on that note, you know, speaking of prioritizations, um, I think the concern that was raised in the letter is that uh, you know, it's supposed to be incredibly demand versus pandemic, and then at the start, I think we're considered essential. Um, but, you know, I know that we've talked to grocery store workers who have said that they and their colleagues are getting sick every day and that they aren't prioritized, you know, in, in many parts of the state. Um, yeah, can you just maybe speak to a little bit about uh, why, you know, it, it is different across counties and why those workers haven't been part of the priority groups, uh, particularly here in, you know, Maricopa County, which is where we've spoken about several of those employees. Yeah, so, um, you know, food service workers, including grocery store workers, um, you know, those are included in the phase 1B uh, essential workers. However, Maricopa County and Pima County have not reached the 1B category just yet and have not expanded to essential employers. And then as we talk about the differences in counties, um, you know, it's going to depend on the numbers of the potential um, the numbers of the estimated population of each of those groups and where that kind of falls in the priority. In one group, in one county, they may prioritize agriculture if they have a large number of individuals that they know need to be vaccinated, whereas another county may um, prioritize transportation or grocery stores. So it's gonna be left up to the counties, um, but we continue to work with them. And as we get that information, we'll be adding it um, to our infographic and our website. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, next up is Leon. Hang on one second. Oh, he's all set. Hi, Leon. Hi, Dr. Priest, uh, Leon Felipe Gonzalez, Univision, Arizona. Uh, we were talking with the uh, local authorities in uh, the city of San Luis, and they are mentioning that even though they have uh, 35,000 people, uh, less than 1% of their population had the vaccine. What is happening in this city? And at the same time, uh, uh, people who are working on the fields coming from Mexico, uh, they are not able to get the vaccine because of their condition. So could you explain us a little bit about this situation in the city of San Luis? Um, so I'm not uh, familiar with the specific situation in the city of San Luis. I know that we are working with the Yuma County Health Department to make sure that we are giving vaccine, um, understanding that all of our border communities are gonna have uh, different populations. We know we've got federal partners that are down there. We know that we've got migrant farm workers, as well as those that work um, back and forth across the border. And so we continue to work with them. I'd have to look into that specific San Luis situation to identify what was, uh, what was occurring there. And could you confirm that they have less than one percent of people vaccinated oh i i don't yeah i don't know the data on that off the top of my head and a uh, last question uh, if eventually johnson and johnson uh, johnson vaccine is available 
and the person who have the appointment uh, doesn't feel comfortable with that vaccine, this person is able to choose or to change the appointment in order to get the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine? So that would depend on the site that they're at. Some sites only offer one type of vaccine, given you know that there's got to be two doses, the, the interval between them change. I, I think that it's um, if somebody wanted to n not have one vaccine over the other, they absolutely could cancel that appointment. And if they can find another appointment with one of the different doses, um, that, that would be their prerogative to do that. Thank you, Dr. Quist. Okay, next up is Stephanie Innes. Hey, Stephanie. Hi, Dr. Christ. Um, I was wondering about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. How are you going to choose where that goes, where those initial doses go? Yeah. So we, we are still in discussions with our, our county health departments for that. Likely what we'll do is we will allocate it based on a pro rata population. So the counties will get a certain percentage based on their population in Arizona. Um, and then they'll be able to decide which, uh, which um, providers they want to distribute that to. One of the recommendations we've made since it is a one-dose vaccine is to potentially utilize it for populations that are, you know, uh, populations that may have difficulty coming back or being found for that second dose. So that's one population. Um, the other thing would just be to distribute it very much like we do the, the Moderna and um, just have people, some providers may get Moderna, some providers may get the Janssen, and then the, the providers can decide, you know, which types of doses they want to use. So we're still working on, on the, the overall distribution plan, but um, trying to figure out because there's going to be people who want the one dose because they're either afraid of needles or they don't want to come back, or there's going to be people that want the two dose. Um, and, and so it'll be interesting to see how the community reacts to the different types of vaccine. Thank you. Next up is Katie Davis Young. Hi, Katie. Hey there. I think I asked the same question last week, but uh, the end of February is now just a couple days away, and I don't believe you started booking appointments for State Farm for March or Kings Municipal for March yet. So, are those sites just going to do second doses for the first part of March, or are those appointments opening up soon? Yeah, those appointments should open up soon. We th we think sometime potentially next week. We're still looking at the logistics of the scheduling. Um, they do have uh, appointments booked for the first part of the week. Um, so we, we're taking a look at when to open up that schedule. That's it for me. Thank you. Okay, next up is uh, Caitlin. Hi, Caitlin. Hi, thanks so much. Um, so how worried is the state of Arizona about the different variants of COVID-19 and most specifically the California variant? So we continue to monitor the, the variants. I, I think as with any virus, the variants are always worrisome from, you know, a is this going to be able to get around immunization? Is it going to cause more infections kind of, kind of worry? As we've been monitoring um, the the vaccine data. It does look like the vaccines are still effective against the variants that we have seen. So that's all really good news. Some of the vaccine um, manufacturers may be tweaking it a little bit to give it even more to be more efficacious against it. Um, but we do continue to monitor. Um, the California and the, the UK strain, um, we're not quite as worried right now about um, those strains. We are watching other strains. Um, as, as they continue to progress. But that's one thing viruses always do. They are always looking to mutate and create variants. So it's, it's something we're watching for. So is that something that we're testing for here right now? Are we testing those currently? Yeah, so there's, um, the, the, the drug manufacturers are actually doing the, like the uh, efficacy studies for the variants. So we're not doing that, but we are sequencing. And so the state public health laboratory can sequence the viruses. Um, if they meet specific characteristics uh, that could indicate that it might be a variant. So we can do sequencing there, but we also have a contract with TGen, and we send them a certain number of samples in order to do sequencing on a random selection of, um, of samples. And then we also work with CDC. And so we've got laboratories here that are partnered with CDC to send a certain number of those um, 
of samples to the CDC so that they can test for those variants. And we're also working currently um, on a partnership with ASU to do sequencing as well. Awesome. And then my last question for you is, is there a plan if this variant becomes a more prominent strain of the virus? So we, um, yes. Reactive. So we continue to monitor what we do. Um, if a variant is identified, we start to do our, I mean, we do contact tracing, but we start to do significant contact tracing and partner notification for, for those um, to identify potential spread so that we can get out in front of that. Our epidemiologists work with the county health departments when those variants are identified so that we can see what the potential spread is. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. And next, um, Kiara, did I accidentally uh, lower your hand? Do you have a question? Hi, yeah, Kiara from Arizona's sure. family. So a new study just came out of Southern Nevada that said 36% of people trying to get their second dose were no-shows, and I was just wondering if uh, Arizona has seen a trend like that. You know, I, I would have to check. I know that at the... Um, at, at our state pods, we tend to see a 10, per, 10 to 20 percent no-show rate, um, and so we factor that in when we develop appointments and when we're when we're um, potentially activating the plus one. Um, I have not heard specific data about the second doses, so that's an it's an interesting question. Okay, and I have an, another question for you. We always get calls about you know people wanting to register, having trouble registering. Is there any advice you have on people trying to register uh, at the site, especially with the, the new state run pilot opening up? So what we would recommend is go in and make your profile um, prior to when you need to get on and register. That will already have the information stored, so then you can just go in, choose who you're making that appointment for, and then start to select the appointment. One of the things that we've heard um, a lot of feedback on is that the site didn't save uh, an appointment while you were trying to finish up the registration for it. So we are um, making some modifications to the to the appointment um, system so that when you get that appointment, you're going to then confirm and then you have that appointment confirmed and then you do the rest of the information um, instead of allowing the um, instead of allowing the uh, appointment to just sit there kind of in a limbo so somebody else could also be scheduling it and if they were faster it gave it to them and you had to restart it over so now what will happen is people will go in they'll see the appointment when they click to confirm that appointment it'll just go if it's already been taken it'll just go back but it'll be a matter of seconds versus number of screens so we're hoping that that will fix um, that but we're also working on an overall hold of the appointments um, for future releases as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Next is Danielle Miller. Hi, Danielle. Hey, Dr. Chris. Thanks for uh, taking my questions here. Just a few of them for you. Um, in terms of the Johnson & Johnson vaccination, how soon, I know you said by you know early March or whatnot, does that mean that those vaccinations are actually gonna be administered or is that just a shipment of it? And then also, you know, with the storage and it being a single dose or whatnot, um, what does that mean for the smaller counties, the smaller communities, the rural communities um, here in the state? So we are anticipating, um, based on our previous experience, we when when they approved the the Pfizer and the Moderna. That happened like on a late Friday night. Saturday it went to Verpac. They shipped it out Monday, and it was in the state with within Tuesday. And then, you know, getting that into the the providers and getting them vaccinated, they were able to start vaccinating Thursday or Friday. Um, we would anticipate a schedule like that. We just don't know when they're officially going to get that allocation loaded once it's approved. So it could be um, we get it sometime this coming week or very, very early in the next week. Perfect. And then I'm just about the smaller communities, oh, yeah. what would that mean for them? So this is going to be a game changer because, um, you know, it's one dose. It's got, it doesn't have the stringent um, storage requirements. This would be a great thing for doing mobile vaccination, especially out in rural communities. You only have to go once and they are considered a completed dose. So they don't have to go back for that second dose. So we think that this is going to be a really positive um, 
addition to our vaccination strategy, especially for our rural counties. Perfect, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, next I'm gonna call on Bud Foster. Hi, Bud. Can't hear you. Hang on, Bud. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Uh, all right, thank you, Dr. Gross. Thank you very much for taking my questions, and thank you very much for doing this. We really do appreciate it. My uh, question is, is when you go to the state dashboard and you look at uh, the metrics that the state has, has established uh, for hospitalizations and cases and positivity and such, uh, they've fallen into the yellow, and I think hospitalizations is now down into the green. Is this too soon to start talking about maybe releasing uh, or easing some of the restrictions? Uh, that the state has in place and if so we can start talking about those what restrictions might we talk about loosening a little bit so as we as our metrics continue to improve things that might be discussed would be you know increasing capacity um, potentially opening other industries um, easing restrictions on uh, large groups those types of things would be the things that we look at um, we normally wait for all of the metrics to get down into the yellow for two weeks and to, before we would start just like uh, loosening some of those things, um, but we're continuing to monitor that. So there is the possibility that in the next couple of weeks we might see that if the numbers continue to, to decrease? Yeah, so um, we, we do a look ahead in our, our, our PDF that we post. Um, and it does look like in the next couple of weeks, we will have a couple of counties that may be back into the, the moderate range, and that would be fantastic. The whole state you know, is, is trending in the right direction. So it's really and, good. And just one quick uh, one follow-up um, on the, uh, the no-shows. If you say that 10 to 20 percent uh, maybe are not showing up for their uh, second dose, how concerning is that? So we anticipate that the first dose is about 50 to 60% effective. So it's still gonna provide some type, some level of protection. Um, with the Pfizer and the Moderna, it's, the efficacy has really been studied with the two doses. So we can't say for sure that you'd have that 100% reduction in hospitalization and um, death like occurred in the clinical trials. Um, but, uh, we just don't have the data. So we recommend that you get that second dose um, to make sure that you get that full uh, efficacy from the vaccine. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay, next is uh, a, re a second question from Nicole Gregg. Hi, Nicole. Technically, I think it's number five. But, That's okay. Um, <laughs> I just <laughs> Thanks. I, I just have a supply chain question. Yeah. What's the deal with your ongoing request of 300,000 additional? Are we ever going to see this or are we going to start seeing increased um, uh, vaccine supply like we need? So I, I, I don't know that we'll actually see a big bolus of 300,000 doses all at once and then again every week. Um, I do think we will see increased vaccine. Um, probably, you know, we'll, we'll see more doses like we have the past couple of weeks. We'll see that through March. And we've been told that the production is supposed to significantly pick up it through March and into April. Um, so we would anticipate as that goes, then we will, we will start getting closer to where we can um, start vaccinating the general population. But I don't, I don't know that I'm going to get the, my, my big 300,000 dose uh, shipment anytime soon. Thank you. Okay, and returning for his 75th question is Howard Fisher. Hi, Howie. I, I, I just got to follow up on this issue of 1B here. Uh, yeah. So I was looking I was looking at the 1B, and it includes bank tellers, auto shop workers, public transportation providers, grocery workers, and yet those are all classified higher than somebody who is in 1C who is an adult of any age with high risk medical condition? How do you justify that? So the recommendations that VAPAC made are um, based on uh, recommendations from ASIP. And so they look at the benefit um, versus the risk of who's getting vaccinated and when, when, the, when the vaccine is limited. And so when you look at those people that have to uh, continue to go to work and have direct interaction with the public, 
um, and they can be any any age range. We do know that those people are going to be at increased risk for potentially catching and then transmitting COVID-19. And you still need those in order for our communities to continue function. Those jobs are essential to make sure that people can eat, can get to work, can continue to function. And so that's why the essential workers are prioritized before those with health care uh, conditions. And I think okay, I still don't see communication workers on there. I'll that's send, okay. I will send it to you, Howie. I promise you guys are there. I promise. <laughs> Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Christina. Hi, Christina. Hi, um, thank you so much for taking your question. So uh, my question is, we were talking about those vulnerable um, uh, populations and the possibility of maybe getting them the Johnson & Johnson vaccine since it's one shot. Do you expect the pushback from those populations who would maybe rather prefer a Pfizer or Moderna in that case? Yeah, so actually, um, I'm sorry if I if I miscommunicated. It wouldn't be that we would be prioritizing vulnerable populations for the Janssen vaccine. It would be individuals that may not have an ability to return or, you know, you may not be able to find for a second dose that we would encourage, encourage that um, because of mobility issues or they may move on and you just want to get them vaccinated. Um, but we're not looking at prioritizing the vulnerable communities. Now, getting it out to the rural communities where, um, you know, you've got uh, storage and handling requirements that need to be less stringent, or it may be in a remote area that you can only get to once and trying to get back to would be difficult. It would be for those types of things. But that will be left up um, to the counties to uh, prioritize to those providers who feel like they've got a really good case for using the Janssen. See. And then uh, just to follow up on vulnerable um, populations, I know you spoke about maybe trying to get out more of those like mobile pop-up pods. Um, is that still um, the goal to try to get out and reach them? Yes, so we're partnering with Maricopa County on um, you know identifying high risk areas to get either pop-up vaccination sites or established vaccination sites with trusted partners like Equality Health and Arizona, um, so that they are more local in the community. That's going to help reduce barriers. But yes, that still is a very important strategy that we are working on. Thank you. Welcome. Next, I hope I pronounced it right this time, Kira. Yes, you did. Thank you. <laughs> I just had a follow-up on easy restrictions. You said there's a couple of counties that seem to be moving into the matter of phase. Can you specify which one those are? And um, oh, if you can talk about what using restrictions, like exactly what that would look like. Yeah. So. Um there, I think there were three, and I can get Steve to follow up with you, um, but I think it was three if you looked ahead um, in the next couple of weeks. One of them was Yavapai. I, I, I'm blanking on the other ones right now. Um, but what, what we would do, you know, we do have the benchmarks that do give some kind of guidance on um, when things can be loosened. Um, and as we move into the moderate range and substantial, it's things like uh, capacity at certain types of businesses. It could be opening certain types of businesses as we get um, farther into um, our metrics being good, as well as um, potentially reducing limits on size or expanding those sizes um, as we get farther out and as more people get vaccinated. Thank you. And I do have one more question. Um, what role does the state's takeover play in the overall vaccination mission, especially in the East Valley? Yeah, um, so we partner very closely with Maricopa County and, and all of our counties, actually. Um, what we are uh, looking to, to help with is to keep some of those mass vaccination sites while there's still a huge demand. Because we can partner with um, our, our partners at the Arizona Department of Emergency Management and the National Guard and all of those, um, transitioning uh, the, the pods to state pods as those contracts are um, coming to a close, and then um, giving them the ability to do what 
they do best, which is they know those communities, they know where those high risk areas are, and really focusing on working with the experts in those communities to do the pop ups, the mobile, the you know the uh, business based uh, vaccination sites, so that they can get it farther out into the community. Thank you. You're welcome. Back with a question is Pete's Peter Samar. Hi, Peter. Dr. Chris, do you have any concerns of another spike in cases and infections over spring break? They all start next week with spring breaks. So we, we continue to um, continue to monitor. There could be a, a spike after after spring break, especially if there's a lot of travel um, and then people go, you know, come back and go to work and that kind of thing. Um, what we would hope is as we get more and more um, vaccinations that will help so even if we do get a risk a spike you know we've we've been vaccinating those high risk individuals that are more prone to hospitalization and death um and, and so we continue to monitor i you know i don't want to say that there's not going to be a third spike because there very well could be especially as we see more of the variants but hopefully it would have less impact on our hospitals and and deaths we can only hope, I would imagine, that the uh, younger people, the college students who go on these spring breaks predominantly are carriers of the virus and even though they're less susceptible to uh, injury or death because of them. Yeah, you know, we, we did pretty good after Super Bowl. So that, you know, it that could have been uh, uh, caused a, a spike. We're still continuing to monitor, but, um, you know, yeah, when people when people travel and spend time with people that are not in their household, that does increase the risk for COVID-19 transmission. Very well, thanks again. You're welcome. Hey, Dr. Christ, we are out of questions. So thank you very much, and thanks to everyone who joined us today. Yeah, thank Have you for joining day. us. We appreciate it.